So we have, uh, this is a thing called tweaking, which is just a bit of, I'm very into these things, they build all the time. But this is quite, it's beautifully done, right? We're in this uh, interesting era of mixing science and, you know, and the stories you have to tell. It's not just written down anymore in nice words, although that always helps. Um, maybe you can't see it so well, but you can look at this later on. But it just fills in with what people are tweeting. You know, it gives you a sense of, uh, of course, which part of the world is alive and awake, and also then, you know, which, which populations are being in, it's what you would guess, of course, but uh, it's Australia, I think it's Australia, so sad. So, Australia, <laughs> Australia, which is somewhere off the bottom of the earth there, as, as always, has just this kind of like, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, there's nothing in here, where it's very, very, very hot. I mean, you may have seen this story recently, which, um, is that, uh, so the, the Meteorological Bureau or whatever in Australia has added a couple more colours to the heat index thing. Magenta, or, I think it was on Colbert, you know, it's like, it's got some bad names for these, these colours. But they've had to add a few more to the spectrum because it's hot. So it was 117 where I grew up the other day. Um, which, is, which is a pretty hot area, it's down here, but this is hot. It's unbelievably hot. There's a place called Marble Bath, which I like, I keep it on my little uh, you know, weather thing. Tell Springs. This is Marble Bar. This is the next. <laughs> 103, these are the max for the next week. And the minimums are 80, 79, 80, 82, 82, 82. That's famously quite hot in Australia. Um, so, you know, that's the decent temperatures, but it'll get up to 120 or 30 or something like that sometimes. When it gets really hot. Really hot. From this guy from Death Valley talking about how hot it gets, you know, living there and how hot it gets there. He had this distinction between 117 and 118. 118 is really hot. 117, okay. You know, you can walk around. 118. So, yeah. <coughs> we like to talk about weather and food, all right? This is really ultimately about survival. Why is this about survival? Okay. What do you think about that? Um, all right. So, uh, I was going to talk a little bit more about these uh, animal things. And then we'll have some more, another kind of mechanism, if you like, another way that these power walls pop up. Uh, in a somewhat benign kind of fashion. Right? So we have nice distribution and tools and so on, which cover about the reasonable uh, uh, mechanisms, failure type mechanisms, and then somehow power walls appearing. Uh, and then I want to talk about projects for a while, so there'll be a section of projects. So I'm just going to go through some uh, fun things that people have done in the last, particularly the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and, uh, Again, points that you can take off and do new research with, or you can work on stuff that people have uh, figured out, or sort of figured out, and you can attack a, a paper that's appeared in Science or Nature, much you claim, but it's possibly wrong. <laughs> it's a very important thing. I want you guys to know that uh, scientists lie, or just make, just make mistakes. Um, so I'll be happy to find that out. All right, so let me see. So I have. I'm very excited about this. this is a, I'm not always excited about this, but this is the second section of power to size distribution. There'll be Mandelbrot, Herbert Simon, um, there's some good fun in there. And it's the, it's the great mechanism, which gets really good. Really. Alright, so that's next. Let's see, so we are on this one. Okay, so I, I had, a, I had a, um, an error in my slides the other day. And the senior professor's watching. 
Well, this God is one, but the senior professors in there mm -hmm. count things. So the lashings occurred, and um, so I fixed it up. Let's see if it was. Uh, oh, yeah, it's back in just the random walk section. So I added another page in here, just to clean this up. Right, there's a bunch of fusion. So this, this little uh, expression is cleaned up now, and there's a page that comes before it. Um, this is just a simple probability. Right, so there's this extra page here. So this is a, this is a background, just random walks, very nice, you know, none of the first return stuff, just random walks. Um, so if you have any specific random walk, Right? Just for a start, one that's, that's on the path. Well, that's a unique random walk. Right? The chance that this exact form happens, if this is t time steps, is one half to the power of t because you have to follow exactly this path. Now, on the other hand, you could have another random walk that ends at the same place, and that's what we're interested in. Here. That's why we get this, this normal distribution. Every walk that ends back at zero, every distinct walk, has this chance of happening. It's just that there are many ways to get there. That's the first statement. Um, and then this is a quantity, so I've kind of unified it. So this is the quantity that uh, we look at in various ways. So NIGT. So random walk starts at x equals i, ends at j, takes t time steps. Uh, how many random walks will do that? And so there's a little, you don't have to worry about this, but there's a little calculation there to do that. All right, so that's just cleaned up. This connects to your assignment. Uh, and then we're at first. To. So we got to this. Okay, so here we go. So we got to this uh, this um, uh, kind of clever matching uh, technique to figure out that the number of first return walks, ones that started at zero, ended at zero. First of all, if we think about the ones that started at one and ended one, but don't ever go below one. That's turns out to be the same thing with a half floating around. And then we figure out that there's this mirroring story. That for every random walk that starts at minus one and ends at one, there's a bad walk that goes from one to one. It matches a bad walk that goes from one to one. Bad means one that drops below one. So that's an example. As long as we flip the first part of the blue, the blue uh, random walk, the first time it hits zero, we just flip that part. So another example here that creates a bad random walk that starts at one, ends at one. So that gives us a way of. Uh, because it's easy to count, it's easy to count walks that go from i to j. That's not too bad. It's part of these boundaries and so on. This is a smart way of turning this problem of first return into two relatively easy pieces to cut through. So this is the number of walks that start at one, end at one. The number of walks that start at minus one and end at one. Okay. So, All right. So your game at the end of uh, the second assignment is to is to Play with those guys, which are quite on yours. Do Sterling's approximation. You know, any month guy is figuring out Sterling's approximation. Um, we forget the we forget the other sad characters. So the number of walks, it's growing actually exponentially, right? This is this power to the n on top, so that's pretty pretty nasty. And there's a polynomial piece on the bottom. This is the end of the three halves. And there's three halves, as soon as you see this, at the end of this course. You know a lot about parallels, and if you see a three half sitting at the bottom of something, you must you need to be able to think that is equal to one and two. That is a very bad situation. The mean is going to be large. The variance and all the other moments going to be and moments, second, third, fourth moments going to be large as well. Which, uh, you know, and depending on the upper cutoff of the uh, of the system, that's going to be tied to that. So in some sense, infinite. Uh, that means you use your, when you select from this, your average guy is large. And because this is a theoretical, it's a random walk process that can go on forever, large in this case means infinite. So your average guy here is infinite. So again, this is the drunks wandering around, right? What's the average time you expect to see your friend again? And it turns out to be infinite, which in some cases might be a good thing, right? <laughs> so, um, but just think about those, and you get to make your decision whether you should go up. So, uh, normalized number of parts gives a probability. So this is a number, we have to divide by the total. And so there's two to the two n, right? There are two n time steps, and so at each time step, there's there are two choices. So you have two times two times two times two, two to the two n possible paths. 
a lot of parts. So you can see when you divide through that, it's going to clean up that guy to turn into a probability. That's exactly what we're doing. So we've got just, right, everything is here. So we're going to put a 2 to the 2n in here. These guys are going to cancel. This 2 to the minus 3 halves is quite nice. It's going to, we can join it in with this n. So that's good. So we'll bring that 2 down there, that 2 to the minus 3 halves, and stick it in there. And then we can see this is actually proportional to t to the minus 3 halves. Right? We did this thing where we said, okay, let's take even numbers of steps. So we said t is 2a, just to help ourselves, slash confuse ourselves. But um, that's the only way to get back to the origin, we have to take an even number of steps. So we built that in. 2n is t, so we put that back in, we've got a proportionality. So that's our probability, decaying is t to the minus 3 half. Comes out of benign, simple little random ball. Good to know. Um, if you turn it into a continuous problem, if you think about a continuous problem, it's a lot of fantastic math if you can get excited about that. Um, don't recommend it, but if you do, you, you, you'll be very happy. Uh, linear processes, all sorts of things. Um, nothing to do with the congressman. So it's normal, normal we know. So uh, it's normalizable, big deal, right? So as long as that exponent up there is uh, greater than one, so it's t to the minus gamma, as long as that's greater than one, you can normalize it. That means your friend comes back. Um, so what we, we, the random order terminology here is the, the random order always comes back, recurrence. Right? So recurrence. Uh, as I said, all the other, everything else, the mean, the variance, all the higher numbers are uh, infinite. Uh, the so random number must return, right? must return, but you will have to wait on average time. Very, very straight. Uh, so there's a sort of extension here. Because you can you can think about random walks, you can think about first passage times as well. You can imagine what's the chance that you hit this, or if this is, you know, if you're gambling, what's the chance that you hit this, which is zero one. Okay. So it's bad to gamble and hit someone who has a different amount of money. Now, that should be obvious, probably, but straight up. But um, this is just a little bit of math to pack them up. People's brains work in funny ways, right? It's very easy to do So you know, so in Las Vegas, it went from having to pull a, right, you have to pull the lever, which in Australia is called the one arm bandit, maybe it's one here. Um, and then it went to a button. You go, press a button. And then it went to put your credit card in, you Watch. Just stand back, watch it, watch your money go over there. And people like it. So, um, this, you can always create an area without trying to do this. So, um, anyway, that's bad. Alright, so you might ask about higher dimensions, you might think about what about random walkers on networks, and this thing starts to connect with us with Google, and it's like right? Google runs random walkers on networks. That's a nice idea. So, it's not just us or madness, it's madness that made some people uh, a lot of money. Um, we can get to that. Some linear algebra fans in here will, will know about that as well. We were talking about that. Um, so, uh, uh, in two dimensions, so just imagine now a grid. We set out, so now we're in Manhattan, the, the above Houston, and, or somewhere in the west, I suppose, and we've lost our friend. They've gone off with one of So, they're in a little more trouble, kind of obviously. Rather than well, one dimension, one dimension, uh, you get to come back with more of a chance. So, dimensionality, big deal. Dimensionality in networks, not a big deal. It's, it's really a local degree, we'll get to that later. Uh, so, there's more of a chance of escaping. But it turns out, so again, it'll take an infinite amount of time on average to come back, but it's normalizable. So, the, uh, the character in question, who's not doing so well, will come back. You can pull it out. Um, but actually, not in three at high dimensions. So this gets to some other pieces about two or three dimensions that I'll mention. But once you get about three dimensions, too many ways to escape, they may never come back. Alright. So if you want to lose someone, you might want to put a three dimensional space. Alright. Terrible, I need a new thing. Okay, so um, I know you're all good, innocent people. So um, <laughs> uh, finite spaces. So if you have a finite space, what happens with this diffusion process? So imagine where uh, you're on a little, just a little grid like this. And of course, we do what we do, love to do in physics, or and now we'll join these two balls together, and then of course we have a donut, right? So you're 
do a little characters lurching around on a donut. But <laughs> oh, so the donut world, and then so you, what what happens here, right? So of course they're, they're always going to return eventually. What you see here is that it diffuses uniformly, right? So that you end up with probably in, in any one place being equal all the time. So that should make sense. Right? Eventually, the, the origin doesn't matter. You're going to fill up all space. Um, and so this is a big, big deal. You may, I'm not sure if this word is used exactly in uh, chaos um, dynamics calls the example teaches, but you talk about the invariant density of a dynamical system. So long term, what are the possible places in basins that uh, that a system could visit? You talk about it being ergodic if it likes to go everywhere, not ergodic if it, if it gets trapped. Uh, and we see these very non trivial, so strange attractors, these kind of fun words, good branding, very good branding in chaos, um, that arise in, in um, chaotic systems. So on networks, networks are very interesting. So networks, you have a different thing. So uh, we can, well, we, we sort of did this in, in uh, linear algebra, but we can touch on it again. We'll touch on it again, possibly. So on networks, if you have a random walk, that's a finite network, the random walk will visit, and it's just a nice the nodes and links, nothing special, the links are all. Form weight, the nodes are all the same. And you just you started a node and then you just randomly choose one of the neighbors and you lodge after that neighbor. So if you do that, then you end up with, and you want to, at any point later in time, so you wait a wait a long time and you count how many times your little walker has visited these nodes, and then eventually you see it's proportional to node degree, which is the number of frames each node has. So this brings up a, a nice uh, Realization that in fact it's not that in normal diffusion you visit every place. It's not so much that actually. It's you visit each edge. It's edge space that matters. And you, you traverse the little uh, joints between uh, the paths between the, the, the spatial points. So, you know we tend to think of the nodes. If you think of a node, you know that's what we can We like standing in a place, but it's the movement that actually matters more. Here. And so on a network. Let's take a very simple network. So you've got this one here. Uh, yeah, all right. So you'll end up with a 2 to 1 to 3 to 1 to 1 ratio. This is, this is the degrees. So you look at the random walker go all over the place. Eventually, over time, you see that uh, uh, there's three times as likely, the, the, the three times likely to be here as they are here, here, and here. And it's proportional to degree. And it's what you really do is if you look at the edges, though, the chance that they're on any edge. It's uniform. So that's different. So that's where this kind of story of diffusion of everything being the same and, and spreading out um, still works. Like, usually we have this idea that everything turns into soup. It really depends on the space. So that's the state, statement down here. Hashtag through the group. So it's the, the equal probably is still present. You still get that feature, but it's actually in the movement. It's in the edges. But that's really what it was. And that was mass when we looked at things that were pure grids like this, because the edges and the nodes, they're both distributed, they're both, they're, they're uniform, they're both uniform. I tend to go for the space story, that's the easy thing for us. Uh, so yeah, so Google traditionally does this sort of thing, and did this sort of thing, and of course when it started it was a great transition, uh, search engines were terrible, because if you want to find fish, you just find pages that said fish a lot. Um, Names like the site and why others. <laughs> a long time ago, alright, so I think I, my wife's a job, so she's written about she's a write about, she's written about various companies that we use, and for a while she wrote about you know, before the dot-com thing, she wrote about all those companies. Really interesting to uh, see the insights. Uh, anyway, complete disaster thing. Uh, Google comes along and actually just works, right? But it's now much more messy and so on because people figured out how to get Google, but it's all you know, it's, it's much harder than just writing fish a lot in the metadata. <laughs> you have to write, you have to make lots of sites that talk about fish and say this site look good. And these sites are really good. These sites are really good because so it comes with networks. Clever. All right. Okay, so that's the, the random. So I'm going to give you a little example. It, it brings a few uh, pieces into play. It's a toy model of landscapes of river networks. Something I know well from a long time ago. So, uh, <coughs> but this is actually from the 1960s. It's Schrödinger networks that they've all named after. Who proposed them? Um, very simple. 
these are fun things to play with. They're just purely geometric, no real physics. At each point, so you have a triangle lattice, at each point you just flip a coin and uh, it's a 50-50 chance that uh, fluid will float one way or the other. And so you do that everywhere and you end up with some kind of river network type structure. So there's a, a basin in here, you can see the edge of it, it's actually expanded right up. And it turns out that the edges of these basins are round walls. So all the stuff we've done just now works. We can think about that. And what I'm going to talk about here as well is some stuff about scaling relations. How often in systems you have many different power walls involved, and maybe there's only a couple that really, really matter. Everything else depends on it. It's a very you know, sensible, normal kind of story. Uh, for systems, for anything you're describing, you know, we want to bring it down to a minimal description. Power laws have their special flavor, which is the exponent. We're very interested in the exponent. This is a huge game, right? What is that? People want to measure the exponents of, of things in, in real systems. Uh, I'll tell you later on in the course about uh, scaling in biology, so it's going to be a problem about how does the uh, minimal uh, amount of energy that organisms use as a function of time scale as their mass, right? So elephants use more than mice, but how does that work as you scale up? And so there's a claim that that scaling is mass to the three quarters rather than mass to the two thirds, and this is a really good surface area uh, explanation for the two thirds one, the three quarters. The three quarters one is kind of mystic, mystical and strange. The difference is a 12. But this is just, you know, it's debated so vehemently and, and violently by it. And it does matter to some extent for say giraffes and stuff, right? Like scaling up from mice to the people um, matters terribly for mice. But you know, it's, it's a, these numbers matter a lot. So people really care about what they are. Measuring them, as you've started to see, is hard. Uh, and you need your mechanism and story for why the one you've measured is right. So it's a real battle, right? We've stepped away from normal distributions, which have one central, so to speak, beautiful story. This is one beautiful story, the central limit. That's it. It's a beautiful story. Power laws, which are much more important to us, power law size distributions have many of these stories, many of them. So, Alright, so imagine this little network. Uh, the, the boundaries of these basins are going to be random walls. So I'm going to say straight out, it's not what you see much in the real world. Some places you might see this. But it creates a, a series of power laws uh, that describe things like basin area size. And the size of the streams and so on that, uh, that match exactly what you see in the real world in some important characteristics. Okay, so we could do this. So this is a, these boundaries are random walks. So okay, so here's an example. So imagine this is our, our boundary of a river basin. It's going this way. So you can subtract one walk from the other, and then we have something that's got some pauses in it. Subtract one more from another, and we've turned it back into our first return problem. Right, so now this is a first return problem. What we're interested in is what's the distribution of basins sizes, for example? You know, basically, it's just describing uh, the, the landscape. Right? And this, this is, of course, continental scale, Earth scale of stuff. Uh, we get excited when we look at Mars. And planets, and we look at some basin structure there, and we argue about whether it's avalanches or if it's fluids, and you know, water, and then we're going to live there. Of course, it's just silly movies, um, Schwarzenegger. It shouldn't have been remade, but anyway. Okay, I can't remember any lines. All right, so we have um, washed it. That's, that's terminated. Uh, random walk with probabilistic forces. So a basin will be So if you take uh, So at any point you can define a basin So that's, that's an important thing So we could say, let's start at this point The basin, and we go upstream from it And we find everything that contributes to it And that's its basin There's a little basin here If you go to here, the basin is much bigger actually It's this piece so there are basins inside basins. So every point has its own basin. So you can so you get so here's the game. Go to a random point and measure its the basin that contributes to it, drains into it, and what's the probability that that basin's area is 
and such. That would be a power. Uh, and the other piece to add here is what is the, uh, given you start at a point, you go all the way up to the end of the basin, which this one doesn't end, say this one here, this one here. So start, you start here, you find the end of the basin, what's that, what's that length? And you call that the mainstream length. It's a very natural geomorphology. So you might think about, <coughs> right, so these are important things. I know what I did, I changed a number of things. So, um, yeah, so two characteristics. What's the area of the basin and what's its length? And then you can think about its width and so on, but these things will define most of them. Most of them. Right. These basins then are, random, uh, are defined by random or boundaries. So the length of them will be, uh, when, when this first return occurs, that's going to be the length. Um, and as we've seen, that could be very, very long. And the area will be roughly what's under this. <coughs> okay, so basin termination is a first return random wall problem. Just a map of exactly back to what we had. Um, so the basin lengths, the lengths of these basins, we know straight away from what we've just done, are distributed in this way as L of minus 3. Average of, of and then just to, to connect it to real river networks, and so there's no there's no universal story. This is something still argued about a lot. Okay, um, people have lots of mechanisms, lots and lots of models. Um, some very beautiful ones. And I talk about some more of this in complex networks in the next course. So for real river networks, you do see this ubiquitously, right? So this is this is always true, but the gamma is. is where you are, you know, maybe it's measurement area, maybe they're all the same. I don't know. We're not really sure. Our geology is messing with things, it's a big fault or something, it changes things. Alright, so we'll just do a little, we'll just do some of these sneaky little kind of physics scaling uh, calculations. So if a basin is length L, then the width is typically L over half, right? Scaling like that. This is this whole, uh, this is the standard deviation of random walls. Right? So we have some random walk. And then we have this t to the half here. So sigma is proportional to t to the half. That's a typical kind of width because it's not t, it's not t to the third. That's typically how much excursion is. So this is a very rough state. So if it's a blank fail, it's gone out and come back, but typically it'll have that kind of width. So the width grows slowly, and we'll use this word allometry later on. Allo meaning other and measure, but uh, width and the, the width and the length are not growing in the same way. It's growing much slower. So then the basin area we can model in this way. We'll say area is, is proportional to the length of the basin times its width, so a couple of three parts. We'll turn that around. So I'm trying to get a connection. We do already know the distribution of the length, so I'm trying to get a distribu the connection to the distribution of the area. Uh, so th this is the relationship between length and area, so we can do one of these nice little things where we um, go from probability of uh, length to probability of area, and this is standard kind of probabilistic argument. So we need the differentials, so dl is proportional to d, we're just going to stick in a to the three halves, a to the two thirds. So differentiate that, we've got a two thirds, which is not a big deal, there's an a to the minus third dl. So we can replace a dl chunk by something proportional to a to the minus thirds dA. This is how we convert this to the change of variables, right? So we're going to do this again uh, shortly. The change of variables and for, for probabilistic distributions, you need p of the blob, d blob equals p of another blob, d other blob. If there's a connection, if there's a connection, but not equal terms of blobs. So we know we have this distribution, it's L to the minus three times dA. That's our distribution. We're going to replace these pieces by what they are in terms of that. Right, so it's a mistake just to take the L to the minus 3 out, stick uh, L, uh, A to the 2 thirds, and that's not going to be enough. We have to think about the little differential. So, alright, we're doing that. So L gets replaced by A to the 2 thirds. It's minus 3 halves, we'll turn that into A to the minus 1. And the DL gets replaced by A to the minus 3rd DL. Right. So there's an A to the minus 1, A to the minus 3rd, so that means a to the minus four thirds dA, and in general, this distribution for area is something that decays with the power uh, tau, six minus tau. So that's what we'll use for this. Uh, random walks. It looks like this. 
So it's a full third, so that's bad too. Right? So these things can be infinite. On average, the basic sizes are infinite. Um, it's even more um, shallow than three halves. It's a little more extreme. I mean, Aaron liked a different thing, but. All right, so is it okay? Does that seem good, good bunch of lines? Okay. Really nicely packaged lines. Okay, so. Uh, so we have parallel distributions for both of them, we see this in the real world, we have this beautiful little toy model that we can solve very well, and you'll see people claiming that tau is between 1.3 and 1.5, we have four thirds for the kind of more example, between one and a half and two for gamma. Uh, so that was one little calculation. What I want to show you is there is all these scaling relation things uh, that, that you see over and over again in any system that has a range of parallel size distribution statistics. So, this is one of these things that physicists appear and they think they, they can solve the universal problem. Uh, biologists and geomorphologists and other areas have popped up with little power wall things over the years. Uh, you know, so maybe the number of species is a function of the size of islands, the area of islands. Uh, that's a good one, the one I told you about metabolism. Here's one from landscapes, which is that the, if you take any basin, measure its length, typical length of its main stream, so you follow it all the way up, so that could be a little fractal, which is a complication, uh, and measure its area, then you should see this scale. Now, if it's just normal dimensional scaling, this will be a half, right? Length is proportional to area half. That's all good. Uh, the claim is, and actually, that's what you see for real, for, for very large basins compared across each other. There's some claims, and, and this has been a source of great interest for, for people, um, because this is boring. It's just, a, it's just a half that's boring. If it's not, it's some magical thing that we don't understand. Uh, so this idea of h being greater than a half uh, is, has been floated around and since Hack's the 957 paper, they're measuring with uh, uh, in, you know, real physical instruments and so on. Um, you know, it's a reasonable thing. And it's like Perth Amboy from New Jersey. New Jersey Badlands. Um, uh, and so, all right, so, but there are plenty of models that, that, that exist, certainly, certainly make real models that, that are physically motivated that have interesting values of H, non trivial, not right, that aren't just a half. Uh, we saw two thirds, two thirds of the people are random. Right, so we'll redo that calculation, but we'll just keep it as gamma, tau, and h, and I'll show you how these things connect. And it's just to touch, touch on this bigger story of um, you have systems with parallel size distributions, and you have all these different exponents. You have maybe 10 in a bag, there might only be 2 in a bag. It's a good thing. So we have these statements. Length is going to be proportional to area uh, to h. This is Hack's law. This is the parallel size distributions for area and length. So we can do exactly what we had before, uh, instead of uh, uh, three half, what I have here, three, two thirds, <coughs> instead of two thirds here, this is just a to the h. Right, yeah. So we can differentiate that, we get h, a to the h minus one dA, so that's going to be our piece, we're going to plug it in, it's, very, it's exactly the same as the previous slide. Uh, so we know that the length is distributed as L to the minus gamma dL, we're going to replace that L excitingly with a to the h. And we're going to replace the dl with a h minus 1 dA. And so before these cancel, it gives a minus 1. Now it's just minus gamma times h. There's an h here and a minus 1. So we can regroup those a little bit. So it's going to be minus 1 is here. There's an h times gamma, that's this piece. And there's an h here. So all of this is equal to tau. So now we have this relationship. So tau is 1 plus h times gamma minus 1. The most complications you'll ever see is one exponent is equal to maybe some others with some fractions involved. There are always these algebraic so-called scaling relations. So it's a beautiful example of such. What the statement tries to say. Um, so there's a connection between them. So if you measure uh, gamma and h, then tau should you should be able to get it through from this little statement. So it's not, you know, it's not some horrible, complicated, messy thing. It's not related to kind of the signs and causes and exponentials. And, you know, it's not, it's not too. Always these nice little guys like this. Surprise. 
Good. Uh, it turns out there's some more stuff you can get into here, and you can figure out the fact that it actually simplifies to this. So that was one equation with three unknowns. Turns out that you can express uh, however you want, but there are two of them in terms of the other, and this is with respect to h. So tau is too much h. So for the um, random walk model, we have two thirds here, so two minus two thirds is four thirds, and this is two thirds here, so it becomes three halves. So again, so that all fits for that nice little thing. Okay. And so we have only one independent exponent. As I said, we simplify the system description is a good thing. Um, expect these guys everywhere. And then yeah, this is something we'll come back to. It's a big deal. If you want to characterize a universality class of a particular system, then you know, it often falls down to one of these exponents. Right? So the, the random river network one. You would say it's h is two thirds, that's it, that's its class. Right? You might go out and find some real world things that are like that. You know, it might be rain coming down the side of the window or something like that. So that's a particular class, and there may be, and it just depends, there may be nothing between that and a half. Right? There may be no systems that produce an exponent in a, in a reasonable way between, um, say, two thirds and a half. You know, maybe you find some bizarre system that produces seven twelfths. But they're distinct, right? They're separated from each other. They're, they're discrete kinds of systems. And then the details of these, the details of many different systems, they don't matter because they end up producing the same kind of class. We'll see for the, uh, the rich gets rich, richer story that it actually falls out of that kind of uh, beautiful possibility in that there's, there's a, you can actually tune the exponents of file, or you can change the details of models, and you can get Every exponent in one person, which is very unsettling. There's this great hope often when people go into systems that, okay, so every network thing will have agents to do that. But might be there are few. Anyway, this is a great game, just to tell you this is a great game uh, that, that people play that's trying to understand reality. Uh, no. Is there universality? Are there these different types of discrete kinds of models that are separated according to exponents? First part of the work being getting the scaling relations to show you which ones are independent. Alright, that's good. So there's just a couple more pieces to add here um, about random random walks, which are you know they're happening all the time inside of us, so they're ubiquitous things, randomness is huge. Uh, just for modeling points of view, uh, this is actually an old friend of mine. This work was at KIS. This is a very simple model of failure of death. Um, you can reproduce statistics to see for proof wise sort of um, So you have some health at time t and you end up with uh, you know, death occurring when it hits zero. So you can worry about thinking about those sorts of statistics. Uh, streams, this is another thing you'll see these kind of random walk stories again for how sediments dispose, which is a big deal for pollution. Uh, you can Go berserk, and we are just touching on this, right? So we can talk about fractional random walks. So these are nice kinds of random walks. You can have ones that have a bigger excursion, or that you can have ones that are tighter. And so this guy, we talk about them having uh, a typical. I mentioned this the other day. I guess you have a typical uh, a standard deviation that's not t to the half anymore, but t to the alpha. And alpha can you now take on all sorts of values. Uh, you will hear the words levy flights, fractional Brownian motion as well. And so here's a, here's a famous paper, uh, Montreal and Schlesinger from uh, 1982. So, talking about this, so sigma is now scaling to t the alpha. It's very easy to create a random walk, right? Moral wise, it's very easy. To create these walks, you now have to incorporate um, memory. So, it's a harder thing to do, but you can do it because it's like integrals and so on. You have to remember where you're no, I touched on this earlier. Uh, and we end up with these terms, and so this will matter in one of the projects if someone takes it on. Uh, alpha is a half, we call it diffusive. Alpha is greater than a half, it's super diffusive because things are spreading more. If you imagine there would be piles spreading out, it's spreading faster than normal random diffusion. Uh, and if it's less than a half, it's self diffusive. But they're all part of the big thing. Right, so you can imagine this whole random uh, boundary thing for river networks then. Being very nicely here because we've talked about fractional random. Alright, so memory matters. 
this be produced with a memoryless, you know, completely silly system that, that just knows only where it is now and just rolls dice. That's what you put it all the time. This one, you have to know what you're doing. Okay, so Reynolds is a little piece there gives you a touch of where some distributions, some of these crazy distributions might come from. As I said, I want to talk about uh, another origin. We've started this a little bit with the, the variable transformation, getting from one kind of distribution to another, right? So from a benign distribution to a very uh, crazy other type distribution. Uh, and then we have some time to start on the variables. So here's the understanding. So we have very elementary distribution, exponentials. So the exponentials are great, right? They appear for free. Uh, for instance, if you if you think about the um, so imagine the probability of um, of success is p, and you have something that's been trialed over and over again, and you want to see how long it lasts for. So the probability of being lasting t time steps in this case <laughs> will be uh, equal to so it has p successes p uh, t minus one successes so this is probably a success that's right, so a knockout competition if you like and then one and but they're random you, you don't remember anything and then this is probably a failure one minus p Right, so P, 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 and then oh. right. So this is probably that you have the, the thing lasts for that long. So there's a 1 minus P, and then this guy here, and we can, there's a minus 1 here, so let's put that guy. So we have P to the T, uh, and then we can just rewrite this as P is less than 1. Okay, so that's a bit of a deal. So let's write this as uh, P to the T, ln of P. What's the log of a number that's less than one? What's it say? What's the what's uh, important aspect of what that quantity is? Do a number less than one? Take this away. Looks like a chicken. It's negative. Okay, right, exactly. Right. Right. So 1 minus p. So we can build that in, we can say, okay, it's e to the minus t and ln of 1 over p. So this is good, right? This is a, this is, 1 over p is greater than 1, this guy's greater than 1, so this whole thing here is positive. It's always the, very important that having the first assumption actually is to build things that are inherently, you know, this is a positive quantity, this is a positive quantity, the negative is explicit. So, exponential decay. So it's an exponential decay. So if you have, uh, a memoryless system, a probability failure is independent of what's happened in the past. That's a, that's a very simple little way of doing it. Alright, just for fun. So those things pop out. As we've seen, gas things pop out. Um, and this, this will matter later on when we talk about robustness in a really, really nice way. Forest fires and so It's great. Really good. Okay. Okay, yeah. uh, and then, so there's two pieces we have, say, very simple Gaussian exponentials where we have really nice, strong stories. Uh, you know, nothing bad is happening. And then, but then we have some variables in the system that are connected by power rules. If that's the case, then potentially you can get uh, a distribution for one of these variables having power rule size decay. Uh, power rule decay. So, all right, so imagine we have this. We'll do it abstractly to start with. So maybe we'll enjoy that. Um, we have some distribution of p of x for some variable x, and we have a second random variable that's connected to the first guy, right? So y is some function of x. So let's just put in all the horrible uh, truths. So if we want, and we did this uh, just a little bit before, right? we did something like this before in a, from a practical kind of way. This is the general expression. So we want to find the probability of y, and we know it's connected to the probability of x because x and y are connected. So y to y has to equal p of uh, x dx, and we need to replace all the x's in here with their form in, in, in terms of y, right? So if we have y as a function of x, then we have to put in x as the inverse function of y, so we can just dump that in there. 
Uh, dx is going to be, be replaced with dy, and this horrible thing here is f prime of x. This is x gets replaced by the inverse. And then we have to sum over all places where uh, the function of x is equal to y. So that's just, just nasty, nasty business. Right, so what you're doing is, his x and his y, and let's say they have this kind of, well, let's say they have this, I'll give you a simple one, so they have this relationship. Right, so what we're doing is we're saying the probability between x and x plus dx, and y and y plus dy, have to be the same, right, because these things are connected, there's an ion connection between these guys. So, as we go from here to here, we go from here to here. So that's why the differential appears. Need to look through. So this is going up very fast. That matters. Um, what could happen is you have a distribution that's a, a function that is a relation. Right? So there are different ways to get to to that same y. X prime and x prime plus x. We'll change. Right, so you could be between these two values and these two values matches the same, gets the same one. So that's why we have this horrible thing over here. So it's often, this is the expression, it's often easier to do it by hand, just as we did before, to kind of argue your way through it each time. So let's do an example. Um, if you haven't seen it before, it's kind of standard. Um, you should do it all. So, Let's assume we don't have this horrible situation. It's a one-to-one -one relationship between x and y. And we'll take it, we'll imagine we have this, what we're interested in this case, where we have a power law. So y is proportional to x and y is up. So we want y large and x small. Let's do that. So that inverse power law relationship is a big deal. OK, so we do the things we've done before. So dy. Uh, we, we want to find out what dy is, so we write that in terms of um, we just sub y in in terms of x. So this is a simple thing to do. The constant c is a constant that sticks out here. We just get minus alpha comes down here. d of x minus alpha is minus alpha minus one. A little dx hanging around, so that's good. Uh, we'll invert this. So we're making there are different ways to do this, but this is one way to do it. All right, so we will invert this, so now we have dx almost in terms of y, well there's a dy here, uh, there's a minus 1 over c alpha, x the alpha plus 1, we're going to replace that x with this piece up here, nasty, so if you take uh, y divided by c and then raise the whole thing to the power of minus uh, 1 over alpha, that's x, so we're going to replace that and stick it in here, so y over c, and there's a alpha plus 1, there's a minus 1 over alpha there. So now we have dx in terms of y. Horrific. Okay, so dy is sitting there, that's pretty good, and you can see what's happening. This is the piece that introduced the power law decay. There's a y to the minus alpha plus one half. That's just sitting in there. So when we replace the dx, we're going to get a dy, and we're going to get this power law decay for, for y. We're good, very nutritious. Okay. So just getting constants by themselves and writing as y to minus one minus one. So you can kind of see, so minus one we know is a critical uh, value, right? That's when you kind of normalize things anymore. So it's that subtracting off another piece to make it at least normalizable. Depends on the rest of it. Okay, so, so we make the whole thing. We've got p of y dy, p of x dx. We're going to replace the dx by the little piece we put on the other side. And this is what it's going to look like in general. p of x, this is x in here. We're going to just stuff x in here. There's going to be y to the minus 1 over alpha. So it depends on what this function is. And d of x gets all of this good stuff. And there's our power law popping up. Okay, so that's just a. It depends. It, it's going to depend greatly on the behavior of this thing. So, again, alpha, so alpha is positive. This, this number as y becomes large, this thing is decaying, this is becoming smaller. So this whole thing is smaller. So it depends on how this function behaves as this quantity becomes small. So if, if it goes to a non-zero constant as x goes to zero, then this is what you see. P of y is, approaches um, d 
the, just this tail part, y to the minus 1, minus 1 over alpha, this y goes to infinity. Right. If there's some sort of parallel stuff in here, then uh, you have to be a little more uh, careful. So let's say it's x to the beta, so the minute natural behavior is x to the beta, if x becomes small, then that beta will pop in here as well. Right? You get a y to the minus beta over alpha. So, just another correction. But it'll still be a battle. Okay, tremendously exciting. Exponential distributions, for example. We're going to use that same transformation. Is there a nice exponential, normalized exponential distribution? There it is. Good. We do that. There's some, there's some correction terms. <laughs> but basically, we get straight out that minus 1, minus 1 over alpha. Right? So, as x goes to 0, this is behaving. Nicely, it's going to be constant right, over lambda. So we know straight away that we're just we're going to get really what's sitting inside the transformation. The transformation is going to give us all of the behavior. We talked about this, where exponentials come from. Uh, and as I said, this work by uh, Doyle and uh, John Doyle, and he's a very busy character, and Gene Carlson uh, from Caltech and Santa Barbara. It's a really great work. This is a hot theory. How they optimized and told it. Okay. All right. So here's a here's one example distribution that we can go through quickly. So you may be aware. No. So okay. When I was a kid, I forced myself to watch this every night because of the BBC, and um, I thought Daleks were going to invade Australia. But um, you know, it didn't happen. It's flat, so they could they could probably do it. Um, so basically, so this guy had some trouble um, traveling around. And if you imagine, so this is actually a cosmology problem. This is a, this is a relevant problem for cosmology. We were obviously out to lunch in some ways. But uh, if you randomly select a point in the universe, what's the gravity of the Actually catches a, a useful problem. So measure the force of gravity. And this is an observation that that <coughs> distribution will uh, decay to f to the minus five. So we'll have a little, little explanation of why that is using this kind of variable transformation story. Uh, so minus five halves, so it's minus two point five, right? So most of the most of the time, if you're randomly jumping to some point in the universe, it's okay. But it's a big variance, right? It's an enormous variance, minus five halves. You know that it ends very, very badly, to your great surprise, right? So mostly it's the meaningless void that you are uh, landing, and then it's the sun. Um, uh, okay, so the like here. So matter is concentrated in stars, as we have uh, figured out. Uh, and then, so we know force is certainly distributed very unevenly. Um, so let's just imagine relative to one star. So there's probably being a distance from one star, so we're just going to be randomly allocated in space. Uh, it's going to grow as um, R squared, right? That's the surface area of a shell as we move away from the star. So that's that's our one. That's one piece here. So that's a that's not a, of course it, and we're, we're, we're close to the star to the um, could be a bit of a problem to do that. Let's assume that's true. Um, yeah, you know, it's just sort of a, all right. It's like a nineteen seventeen paper by time. Uh, nineteen nineteen. Assume uh, right. There's only one star involved. Law of gravity. We have that sorted out. F is uh, proportional to the inverse. R squared. We turn this around and we get it out of the F. Uh, R is proportional to F to the minus a half. So that's our little, this is our giveaway here, right? That something could happen in this parallel <laughs> relationship. And then we have to connect the differentials. So DF is proportional to D of R minus 2, just putting F is replaced by R of minus 2. Differentiate that guy, so we get R of the minus 3. Get away, throw away constants. And if we turn that around, we have DR is proportional to R cubed. DF, right, so we can put this guy over here, and we replace R cubed with R with F to the minus half, so now we get F to the minus three halves, DF. So that's the good stuff right there, nice, okay. So we have these pieces, this is the relationship between R and F, this is the differential, and this is the probability that we start with. Probably the force DF is, has to match up with probably the regus, uh, so we replace we replace R with F to the minus half, and we know what DR is, it's F to the minus three halves of DF. Proportionality is everywhere. 
This probability was r squared, so it's just this quantity r squared. Really simple. And so this is going to be f of minus 1, f of minus 3 halves, and it's just the bottom of the e sigma. Okay. Ah. Okay. Uh, but we'll come back to, um, to this kind of transformation later on. And I said all these things. So it's a wild distribution. Right. Random sampling of space usually is a bad place. So I have one thing to, to uh, I've said this before, so please blow, you see this in some way, parallel, parallel rain, parallel rain, that's bad, okay? So I'm going to to explain their parallel size distribution, but they've just snuck another one into the stuff, right? So they've made a sausage in the sausage factory, and they've started with the sausage factory. Okay. Um, so it's a sort of a homunculus argument, yeah? So we're, we're very good at those, so when you go back in history, right? There's a little bus inside your head, which is like what you think. There are galaxies inside the atoms and so on, right? We just sort of have a little hard time with the whole emergence thing. So we come up with that. Alright. Uh, so that's bad, and we need magnets. So that's, that's all. So these haven't been. So, uh, well, the random, 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 randomness is absolutely a generative kind of magnets. Uh, the second one is more so a <coughs> sort of statistical connection, but it's showing how benign, reasonable connections. What we'll get to next, and I'm going to talk about projects for the rest of the, this particular lecture. What we'll get to the next big piece that we start on is the so-called rich shapes, which are, which is the. So if you think of um, you know, normal distributions arising from the random addition of, of, uh, of small bits being added up and so on, nothing too, you know, nothing extreme. Then, and that's the found that in the central limit theorem. You know, we, have a, we have a universal story there. Yeah. And, and I said this before, the parallel size distribution arise from all sorts of reasons. Right? Uh, this is, I think, arguably the biggest reason, one you see over and over again. It's this kind of, uh, competitive, it's a competitive system, right? so there's competition from over the cities, words, if you like. Um, people in terms of success, maybe. So it's competitive, and there is a, there's a growth thing. So it accrues to the winners. Right? So uh, rich gets richer. And the extreme version is winner takes all. Uh, and then you can have darling, you can dial things up and down. So it can be that the rich get a little bit richer, or the rich get a lot richer. Uh, this is a really fundamental story that appears, that definitely appears in many, many different systems, many areas. Uh, you know, ecology, sociology, uh, physical systems. So, you know, it's a centerpiece of, of this course to, to put it out there and put it into your head. Um, out of mind. Okay. Okay, so things, yes, make it. What's next? Oh, yeah, let's see how this goes. <coughs> Filling in. <laughs> what kind of slope is this like? Is it a way to do it? Oh, I should just do this. <coughs> oh, yeah. Go back straight. You should be asleep, right? Yes. Wow. Uh, yeah, so there are a lot more people who live in Indonesia than in Australia. There are several hundred million in, in Australia, so I don't know, 30 million now. The kiwis are always, they're always kiwis. If you lift up a rock somewhere, they'll be in New Zealand. And they're like, ah, oh, it's just going for a walk. You know, and, um, I thought I'd climb this mountain. They're really, you know, any, any given cult, you could probably find it in Australia or New Zealand or somewhere, you know, some cult. Um, or there's, some, there's something going on somewhere. There'll be, there'll be one flooding around. Anyway, yeah, this is it. Perth, this is Perth, Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane. Marble bar is out here, but very, very hot, even at night. Uh, anyway, so, uh, oh, I'm going to put a tank. Okay. So, <coughs> the first What is So, so this is, it's not going to be a bit, that's all. Um, it took me some time. I think it's the week before.
for both. I mean, it's, it's a week before the spring break. Maybe it's a week after. Right. We'll, we'll fix that. <laughs> Subject to uh, complaints from the team as well. Uh, so that's the idea. Uh, we have got about 20 people. Nutrition rates being high up, so we're doing all right. Um, and the idea is to give a three minute piece, a three minute, three to four minute talk, and we'll figure that out based on the number of people at the time. Uh, and, then, and this depends on how much time we have at the end. Uh, but this is a, you know, generally speaking, and I, maybe Sensha says, but usually this is a very good experience for advice. People really like this. Maybe I shouldn't say this. But they, you know, you see all these different projects that people are working on, and the idea is for you to present much like trying to do with most people. Uh, you know, it's a gift, right? You're trying to give away this information and pass it So that's, that's your job there, is to sort of frame the thing. Why is it interesting? What's going on? What's being done? Are you doing novel research? Or are you just trying to figure out what these maniacs have done? Right? Um, and, and then, you know, depending on the course of, of that you, you've charted, a, a, a summary piece later on. And, like I said, I think we maybe have 12, 13, so, certainly we'll probably the 15 or 20 papers that come out of people working in this course and so on. Um, and so you, you can add to that if you want. Uh, the idea is you also write it up. It could be just a report, it could be something that's building towards a paper. Okay. <coughs> Seeding research papers, that's fine. Alright. So it's like two extremes. One is to just tackle a piece that exists, understand it. Um, certainly, you know, material has been published in the Major or science or DNA, it's not easy to get through uh, straight away. It's not always about stuff that's solid. So it's a good, it's a really good project to, to lift yourself up and try to understand um, you know, your reason. This is my little narrative hierarchy thing, right? So you need a, a sound bite, a little, a little plus frame thing, sort of thing. Um, one, uh, it's a little encapsulation of what's going on. You need to be able to do this, especially if you're doing a PhD. I interviewed some people the other day, and one fellow said it down. Okay, this is it. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I have a PhD, so I can only talk at this scale. <laughs> Which of you is joking, but, and, and I understand the joke, but this is really, you, this is the battle, you really need to be able to do this. And, and if you can't, then maybe, you know, it's, maybe it's a problem of the problem itself, but it's not. You know, certainly there are things that only exist in this little category right here. It's just a little buzz frame for it, and you might find out there's a nice sentence that goes with it, but there's no depth. So that's a good battle. All right, so I was just going to go through a number of things that we could go through. So we, as I've said, we have this team at the Computational Story Lab, and we have people tackling all sorts of problems. We do have this massive Twitter data set, which we started getting in 2008. We worked on them, and there were only four of them. You know, just the initial four people working at the company, and they said, sure, we can do that. And they'd actually set up a little research week. We still have it, and I'm kind of worried about this. But we worry sometimes that they might just take it away. Because uh, it's hard to get now. Uh, it's very expensive. You want to you know, get a, there are these different feeds, garden hose, the, the spritzer, uh, and I think there's a fly out of one. But um, it's, a, it, it, it's a crazy amount of data. I, mean, it's just, I, don't, I don't even know what we're getting. Maybe any, you know, I mean, we're getting. This is some it's insane numbers. And so uh, terabytes of you know, drives a big pillow. So we've processed these things in some ways and found out all sorts of patterns, but there's a lot to do. Um, and you know, it's a hard data set to work on, but it's not everything. You know, we work on it, we have lots of other data and many, many other interests. So but this is just this great thing we have. So this is people talking about breakfast, lunch, and dinner. This is just to say that, you know, yes, all I talk about what they're doing in real time. Some extent. There are lots of bots on Twitter, of course, um, and other things, but uh, it's pretty good. People really do talk about food a lot. Um, a few people use Facebook, and talk, well, uh, maybe your older relatives than that, but uh, <laughs> it's kind of amazing. I mean, you can use This is informative for us to, to, because we want to be able to see food in real time and sense various things. But there you go, socio info, algorithmo, econo, geo, technical. There's no good way to say this, physical systems. Um, so we've got ourselves a story on that. So if you're interested, you can come to the next 
We also have a huge list. I haven't put up here where we use the list of possible projects, which is sort of insane. Um, another branch of work here, and this is this is, this is hard to do. Uh, you know, I've been involved in a couple of these, and I'll talk about them in this course. Uh, these massive online experiments. Um, they're just sitting there, you know, ready to do it. But we, it it's just it's hard to build these things. I have this funding to do it. Uh, I call it the play project. The orientation is, you know, people are good at what we call, well, I call it playing crunch, now we're kind of called punch and punch, right? So people are good at punches. Um, and I'll have some more examples of this. Uh, it was a good at punching. And, and it's kind of computer science a little bit, the realization that they're not going to take over the world with their AI systems, right? Which kind of not much of a job. Um, you can certainly do amazing things with people who have to use And of course, we've been doing that forever. Google is a, what I would call a socio-technical uh, phenomenon in itself, right? Because it not only work, but there's people made meaningful links between sites and things. People that are intrinsically part of that, of that uh, algorithm. We tend to think it's a cold algorithm, but it's, it's, it's not that it's very much people play plus computers. So there's a lot that can be studied here. Um, I think that I'm going for now is stories, I'm trying to get out. The taxonomy of stories, human stories, um, which stories spread better, and all sorts of you know, these kinds of things. But you can look at the papers, uh, this is going to put it on You can look at the papers we covered uh, in our reading group, our complex systems reading group, keeping current with all sorts of things. Uh, I'll mention some that we have talked about. So there's uh, a body of work that's developed more recently about, and I think I mentioned the other day, so there's the, the Where's George? Stuff and did talk about it. So that's dollar bills moving around the US, and that is this example here. So these the dollar bills that started in Seattle, for example, and ended up all over the country. This is Jacksonville, I guess, and New York. Um, just an example of some places that those dollar bills went to, but it's a much bigger data set. So that's a Dirk Rockman at Northwestern. So the universal scale models of, of human travel. Right, universal, scale, a little bit, big, the nice words of this slide. So they get out some really nice uh, features there. This is looking at people moving around. This is the this is the, so, the cell phone data that comes out that the Paradisi's group has. Uh, so Mara Gonzalez, has, I touched on this a little bit at the end of that zip thing, right, where she had the zip distribution for where people um, where people go, right, right, how frequently they they found places. And in fact, it's predictable uh, to, to a surprising degree as to where, where they'll be. Uh, so the kind of data they have here is a Varanoi cell here um, structure for uh, cell phone towers. So you can see where people move around. Um, they get to some view of the like, universal uh, pattern of how, how people move depending on whether they move long way or the short way uh, on average. So there's a lot in that one. Uh, this is a paper that we've talked about, you can dig into, it's about um, controllability of networks. It's a great problem. Right? So how many different modes, given you know everything about the system, how many different modes, and, and there's a, they're using a pretty simple kind of dynamics that the modes are following, you know, obeying, kind of copying each other, or following each other in a certain way. So if you could dial the values of certain modes up and down, how many could you do? Right? So they go through all of these, so it's everything from Gene networks to social networks, uh, all sorts of to neural networks, all sorts of different types, you know, really disparate networks. Uh, taking them in a kind of a you know, fairly rough way by just saying, okay, there's no there's nodes and there's links, and I'm not going to worry about the weights too much. But it's, so this is nature, this is you know, a great general kind of model. I don't know what this is, right? This is advertising influence and how many people you need influence so you can sell your terrible. Um, I have a lot more to say about that later on. So this is a socio-technical example um, that, I was, that fits into this whole play project idea. It's Hunch and Crunch. So it's a folded game. Um, and the, the story behind this is it's quite interesting because it, I'm only going to get through a few of these and I'll talk about more. more. Um, the, the idea was a sort of citizen science project so that you uh, you would sign up and say, you know, when you have three clock cycles on your machine, it would run some simulations. So, uh, the, uh, 
the SETI project is the first big example of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I mean, certainly the search for terrestrial intelligence might be the first thing you do. But anyway, um, it's pretty uh, about SDI. Uh, so SETI had that, so you're running clock cycles. Right? So you're running, you're running, you're running, you're running a program, the program's running on a machine, it's all very nice. Uh, so people would actually, one of the benefits here was they could watch the algorithm struggling with this protein. Right, to hold it. So this is a great, great problem in biology. How many proteins manage to hold themselves in the shapes they do? Um, of course, there's been a lot of evolution that's got them to these crazy things. It's hard, it's hard to see. So people would sit here watch it. They're watching this thing on the computer and they're frustrated because it's kind of obvious that the thing should go and the rabbit should go around the hole or whatever. Like that. <laughs> it was kind of obvious, right? So people started writing and saying, my god, this is insane to watch. And uh, so they, they, the computer scientists were behind them, they twigged from what I understand that, um, oh, people are, people are smart. Um, and so they, they incorporated people. So now it's, now it's really, you know, it's an interesting thing where people create algorithms for how they're actually running, making up their own little recipes and algorithms and other people are testing them and copying them and so on. So it's a real interplay between uh, massive amounts of uh, computing power and then the intuition and diverse of people. Right? We have very odd faculties compared to what computers can do. But just looking at a picture, right? we can tell it's our grandmother or someone from, you know, we, we can see straight away and people will say, there was a circle uh, on the trouble or something. Like they have no idea. Right? Uh, they're getting better for sure, they're getting better, but it's not. So another great example here is Zooniverse, which is really taken off, and it's it's really nice because it's the it's so citizen science. Right? So the great example is always being astronomy. So one might say, "Oh, I saw a comet, and my name is X." Call it that. You know, and they're happy because it's all good, right? Someone saw a comet, uh, and so there's always been that. You know, the general public has been very helpful with, with astronomy. Uh, so we move to these massive telescopes, and that becomes Less involved, right? Because the little telescope is not really doing the job anymore. Right? They brought the Hubble, and then and you have these massive arrays on, on, on the other surface, and it can get bigger. But the beautiful thing is, it turned out that, well, we've got all this data and we can't sort through it. So there's the first project they put up, I believe, was about uh, figuring out which, um, what, what shape galaxies are. Because that's, I guess, a little difficult AI problem. You can be looking at different angles and so on. You know, so you want people to say it's a spiral one. So people are doing it, they're tagging these galaxies. Uh, and then that's branched out to all sorts of other problems related to uh, astronomy and astrophysics. And they've added some other, other ones, like classifying ancient documents, whale samples, right? whale samples which apparently spread across the Pacific, sort of top uh, So they've added these other things. And it's exactly this, this idea that cross computers can do it. There's some other ones that so captures ESP games, so it's Louis Von Arts, and it captures if you see two words and they're, they're scrambled looking to get into a website. One of them will be harder than the other. So one's been made by the computer, just made, they're made by the other. The other one's probably from a real text that's being scanned somewhere, Google, Google, Google uh, books, and the, the parser hasn't figured it out. So it throws it out to people, and you can actually lie about that one. Because it, it doesn't know. So, uh, but it takes you know, 50 or however many they do to, to they get votes for what these words are. And there's usually like a diploma there, or there's some funny character or something that it's, it's, it's choked on. Um, that was the idea of that. So every time you do these, are, and this is, so this is sort of made by the computer scientists who are somewhat a little bit, I mean, they're good guys, but this is a little more nefarious. Like humans, with they spare clock cycles. I must use them somewhere, right? That's exactly what it's sort of the thinking. The, the ESP game was for tagging uh, photos so that it could be used with program computers, ultimately, <coughs> and silence and killing us all. But um, it's kind of that view, whereas this is a little more like, let's, science is great, you guys can help, um, and we'll, we'll be upfront about what you're doing. Yeah. So I, I'll talk more about these on, uh, on Thursday, and then we'll get into the great assignment. Benoit Mandelbrot, uh, which is which is good fun. So, <laughs> randomness versus uh, <laughs> optimization. <laughs>